moving image culture and working in that culture is for me one of the ways in which I try and connect the two things that everybody else is trying to connect, who you are and where you're going. It's especially important for me because, yes, I'm a diasporic figure, but the ways in which we arrived in this place, by we, I mean my family, was complicated and tragic and painful and violent. And I don't know anywhere else to go where I can find some answers, both affective and psychic and narrative, to the question of why we're here. For my generation, we had very little political representation in the, in the culture. We had no voice, essentially because the culture was still trying to process what you did with a generation of people born for the first time en masse in a society that hadn't known them before. So the process of acquiring a voice was a critical thing. Cultural representation was also important because most of the narratives that sort of spoke about Britishness assumed, either explicitly or implicitly, that we were outside of those narratives. And in fact, some of them, I think, worked in almost violent opposition to the sense of our presence inside those narratives. So the question of how one acquired a voice, both politically and increasingly culturally, became one of the obsessions, both of myself and the collective of our work. We spent four years as a group investigating what we called colonial fantasy. In other words, the processes by which the sense of a center and a margin were constructed in images, in narratives. It became clear to us that these categories of black and white were relational categories. So people had arrived at a sense of who was black by a sense of who was white. And the two fed each other in a, in, a, in a weird sort of way. So one of the things we had decided was that we were never going to, when we started to work ourselves, fix these terms as absolute categories. We were always going to be interested in the ways in which they were historically constituted. So of course, the process of acquiring identity is a dramaturgy of finding a voice and the psychic status of migrancy carries in embryo something about the status of identity in general. In other words, what it is to be a migrant, the effort you make to fit into a culture, the effort you make to find a voice in a culture, the effort you make to find an identity in a culture, pretty much mimics what everybody else has to do anyway except that it's a much more foregrounded, it's a much more dramatic, or in some cases, melodramatic feature of this universal project. says so much with me is that it's the familiar of our DNA. The very invocation of us is impossible without an appeal to some concept of memory. Memory is the, is the engine by which the souls of folk, not just black folk, the souls of folk acquire a value and an importance and a normality.
is memory essential prerequisite to being? Yes, absolutely. And that goes for all being. For being, period. <laughs> If you're a diasporic subject, the archive acquires a special poignancy for you because it is the space of the memorial. There are very few tangible memorials that say you have been here. And so the archive is important because it's one of the spaces in which the memorial attests to your existence. But in the archival, one also finds a struggle, which is outside as well, between the official and the unofficial. Because the archival both brings out what is accepted as what has happened, but it also illustrates sometimes what has to be repressed in order for what's happened to happen. In the archive on post-colonial subjects, you find that drama very, very well written. Sound has a gaze, and I don't mean sound as in music or ambience, I mean just the physicality of noise in general has a gaze and that reverses the traditional kind of understandings that people have about the way sound and image works. Normally the idea is that images are what have gazes or point of views and sound underscores. I'm very interested in the sense of cacophony in the metaphoric sense that sound it has a kind of subversive presence. It has a sort of disruptive value vis-a-vis -vis the logic of images. Images say there's an A and a B. And Sam says, actually, no. <laughs> there's no A and a B, there's just flux. Now I have a certain kind of Catholic taste in the broad range of images from the calligraphic value of writing on screen to stills, photographic stills to move an image, the contrast between contemporary material and historical material. You know, I, I, I'm into bricolage. I like, I like the mix. One of the things I'm trying to do is to build spaces in which you could welcome the mix, because the enigmatic arrives at the point when things are not anchored anymore to the original intent, to the reasons that gave birth to them in the first place. That's when the enigmatic arrives, with all its splendor and terror and magic. I don't believe that there are themes that are universal and themes that are local as self-contained, discrete fragments. I think the question of resonance is important to invoke here because actually in the quote-unquote universal, one finds resonances of local and, and, and vice versa. So um, what is important for me is, is the dialogue between the two in some ways.